whenever stress is applied to a cell, the cell tries to adapt through that stress. If the stress persists, the cell goes through an injury and it eventually dies. But if the stress is removed, the cell is able to return back to its original condition. What we are going to learn in this particular video is about the ways a cell adapts in order to protect itself from the applied stress or the cellular adaptations. So cellular adaptation can be of two types. There's a physiological cellular adaptation and pathological cellular adaptation. Physiological cellular adaptation occurs during the normal physiological process of the body or during normal state. Pathological cellular adaptation occurs during abnormal condition of the body, especially during some kind of disease. So physiological refers to the normal state and pathological refers to the abnormal or let's say diseased state. So I hope it's clear now. If it's not, it will be better cleared once I use various examples. So physiological cellular adaptation is the cellular adaptation during the normal physiological process of the body. Pathological cellular adaptation is the cellular adaptation during abnormal condition, like during the case of a certain disease affecting the body. Okay. On the basis of what happens to the cell, cellular adaptation are of various types. However, among those various types, you need to know compulsorily four of them. Atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, and metaplasia. Let's begin with atrophy. So the word atrophy contains A, which refers to absence, and trophy, which refers to growth. Basically, during atrophy, there is an absence of growth. Let's say there's an organ, the heart. The heart is going through atrophy. Then the size of the heart decreases. Now there are two ways the size of the heart can decrease. Number one, either the number of cells in the heart decreases or number two, the size of the cells in the heart decreases, which eventually leads to the decrease in the function of cell. And this is obviously a reversible process. Because once the stress is removed from the, from the heart, the heart will go back to its original size. So it's a reversible process. So atrophy, there is decrease in the size of the organ, either due to the decrease in the number of the cells or due to the decrease in the growth of the cell or the size of the cell. So now let's look at the various examples of atrophy. First, physiological atrophy. Uterus after parturition. During pregnancy, the size of the uterus increases in order to adjust the baby. Once the baby is delivered, once the parturition has taken place, the uterus goes back to its original size. That is, it decreases in size. And what has happened here? Atrophy of the uterus has happened here because the uterus has decreased in size. And is it taking place in a diseased condition? No. Birth is a normal physiological process. So since it's taking place in a normal state or during a normal physiological development or during a normal physiological process, it's a physiological atrophy. Second, organ atrophy. So as you grow older, there's an organ called thymus gland, which is found near the neck region. So this thymus gland eventually degenerates or decreases in size as you grow older. The same applies for tonsils as well. Tonsils also grow smaller in size as you grow older in age. This is a normal process that takes place in all human beings. So it's a normal physiological process. So it's an example, organ atrophy is an example of physiological atrophy. Next, pathological atrophy or atrophy in an abnormal condition. First, disuse atrophy which is much more common, commonly found in muscles. Let's say you are riding a bike and due to a fatal bike accident, you injure your leg. Since you injured your leg, you are now unable to use the muscles of the leg. After a certain time, due to the disuse of the muscles of the leg, the muscles, they grow smaller in size and the size of the leg overall grows smaller. 
This is called disuse atrophy. Due to the disuse of the organ, it has grown smaller in size. Or you could also see this in bodybuilders. Let's say there's a bodybuilder who has just recently injured his left arm. Now he is unable to train his left arm. However, he keeps on continuously training his right arm. After a few months of recovery, you can see that the size of the left arm is very small as compared to the size of the right arm. Next, and that's exactly why physiotherapy is important because physiotherapy makes sure, that it makes sure that you keep on using the organs that have been affected or injured so that it does not go through disuse atrophy. Next, neuropathic atrophy or denervation atrophy. Whenever there is some kind of problem in your nervous system, let's suppose due to some kind of disease or accident, you are unable to use your skeletal muscle properly because skeletal muscle is under the control of your nervous system. For example, during polio, the polio virus affects the neurons of your spinal cord. As a result, the muscles that are under the control of the neurons of the spinal cord are not under control anymore because the spinal cord has been affected by polio virus. And that is why people suffering from polio virus so limping. That is, they are unable to walk properly or so movement and locomotion properly. Starvation atrophy. So there's a child whose diet significantly lacks protein. What happens? The body of the child starts using the protein present in the muscle of the child. As a result, the size of the muscle eventually decreases. And the overall size of the child also eventually decreases. So due to malnutrition, there is decrease in the size of the child. And that's starvation atrophy. Finally, ischemic atrophy. Schemia refers to decrease in flow of blood through arteries to your organs. Let's say you are growing older and older and older. You have grown quite aged. What happens is the flow of blood to your brain decreases due to which the size of the brain also decreases and this leads to memory loss. It is due to ischemia that old people they suffer, suffer from memory loss or shall I say it is due to ischemic atrophy that old people generally suffer from memory loss and the most common memory loss disease is Alzheimer's disease. Next is hypertrophy. Hyper refers to excess and trophy refers to growth. So basically there is an excess growth of cell. The size of the cell increases in hypertrophy and as a result the overall function of the cell also increases in hypertrophy. It is obviously a reversible sense because upon the removal of the stress the cell goes back to its original size. Let's look at the examples. Physiological hypertrophy, uterine hypertrophy. During pregnancy, the size of the uterus increases in order to adjust the baby. And this is called uterine hypertrophy. Second, pumping iron. When you go to a gym, pump some iron and work out your skeletal muscles. What happens? See, here's the thing. Some cells like skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, neurons these are permanent cells and permanent cells they don't show cell division that is they don't increase in number however they are capable of increasing and decreasing in size so they only show trophy that is they only show change in size they don't show plasia that is they don't show change in their number so when you go to a gym work out your skeletal muscle the skeletal muscle tears and recovers which increases the size of the muscle or shall I say increases the size of the skeletal muscle cell and this is how your muscles such as biceps, triceps, pecs, delts they grow in size. Pathological hypertrophy, cardiac hypertrophy. During hypertension that is high blood pressure your heart starts pumping blood with much higher pressure especially the left ventricle of your heart. What happens is that the wall of the left ventricle increases in size. 
and due to the increase in size of the wall of the left ventricle the left ventricle starts pumping blood with a much higher pressure and this leads to hypertension and this is what we call cardiac hypertrophy which is an example of pathological hypertrophy third is hyperplasia where hyper means excess and plasia means number during hyperplasia the number of cells increase as a result the overall function of the cells increase as well this obviously is a reversible sense because upon the removal of the stress the number of cells come back to its normal number now let's look at its example physiological hyperplasia first uterus hyperplasia during pregnancy the size of the uterus increases in order to adjust the baby when the number of cells found in the uterus also increases here's the fun fact uterus shows both hypertrophy and hyperplasia however it's not that just uterus shows hypertrophy and hyperplasia uterus during pregnancy shows both hypertrophy and hyperplasia which is also called gravid uterus so gravid uterus or uterus during pregnancy shows hypertrophy and hyperplasia in order to increase the size of the uterus the si the size of the cells in the uterus increase as well as the number of cells in the uterus increase okay second during puberty or during pregnancy the size of the breast increases this is due to the increase in the number of cells in the breast and this is breast hyperplasia second bone marrow hyperplasia first let's understand how exactly are red blood cells formed in our body so there's your kidney the kidney produces a hormone called erythropoietin the erythropoietin has its receptors in the red bone marrow in the red bone marrow erythropoietin brings about erythropoiesis which increases the number of red blood cell or brings about the formation of red blood cell let's suppose a person is suffering from anemia during anemia the number of red blood cell decreases in order to increase the number of red blood cell back to the normal number there is an increase in the level of erythropoietin the kidney starts secreting more erythropoietin and this erythropoietin increases the number of erythropoietic cells in red bone marrow so there is an increase in the number of erythropoietic cell in order to increase the number of red blood cells and this is bone marrow hyperplasia bone marrow hyperplasia next pathological hyperplasia first prostatic hyperplasia as you grow older the secretion of dihydroxy testosterone this right here increases which increases the number of cells in the prostate gland due to the increase in the number of cells in the prostate gland the size of the prostate gland also increases the increased size of the prostate gland presses on the urethra and this brings about urinary complications second endometrial hyperplasia in normal condition during physiological condition the secretion of estrogen leads to the proliferation of endometrial lining this is your physiological hyperplasia however let's suppose due to hormonal imbalance the secretion of estrogen is much more than normal as a result the proliferation of endometrial lining is also much more than normal this is what we call endometrial hyperplasia here's the thing in hyperplasia the number of cells is increasing right however it's not cancer hyperplasia is benign that is it does not affect you however if uh, it does not affect you by that i mean it does not harm you but if the process is not under control or the division gets out of hand out of control then hyperplasia may lead to cancer and cancer is malignant let's suppose we are talking about endometrial hyperplasia the endometrial lining is proliferating there is a hyperplasia of endometrial lining due to the excess secretion of estrogen even in this condition the process is still under control but let's say the process gets out of hand or out of control then this leads to carcinoma of endometrium or which is a cancer and it is malignant so the final cellular adaptation is metaplasia in metaplasia the structure of the cell changes in order to adapt through the stress
There are two types of metaplasia. If the metaplasia is seen in epithelial lining, it's epithelial metaplasia. But if the metaplasia is seen in connective tissue, then it's connective tissue metaplasia. First, let's look at epithelial metaplasia. This right here is the respiratory tract of a normal person or a non-smoker which is lined by pseudostratified ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Basically, there are columnar cells. However, let's suppose this non-smoker starts smoking. Then what happens is that due to the effect of the smoke, the epithelium which once contained columnar cells get converted to squamous epithelium and contains squamous or flat cells. What has happened here? Here, there has been a change in the structure of the cell itself. And this has occurred due to smoking. This change is reversible because if the smoker quits smoking, then the squamous epithelium will return back to columnar epithelium. But if the smoker persists on smoking, that is he or she continues smoking, he or she may develop a carcinoma in this squamous epithelium. How would you name this metaplasia? So the naming is given on the basis of the end result. That is the type of cell or epithelium that is obtained at the end of the effect. Since squamous epithelium is obtained after smoking, we call this metaplasia squamous metaplasia. Second, here's your stomach. The stomach contains acidic content. Let's say there has been some kind of complication in the cardiac sphincter due to which the person suffers from GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. In GERD, the acidic content that is present inside the stomach refluxes back into the or zombs back into the esophagus because the cardiac sphincter that is present right here is not able to close properly. What happens then? The esophagus normally is lined by squamous epithelium. But due to the acidic content effect, it changes to columnar epithelium. And this columnar epithelium containing esophagus is called Barrett's esophagus. Since the end result is columnar epithelium, we call this metaplasia columnar metaplasia. So your squamous metaplasia and columnar metaplasia are your epithelial metaplasia. Next is connective tissue metaplasia. What we have here is a skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle at this area has been injured due to an accident. So there's a hemorrhage in muscle. There's bleeding from this area. What happens is that at this particular area, bony deposition takes place. Instead of being recovered by other skeletal tissue, bone-like tissue formation takes place. And what is bone? It's a connective tissue, right? So what's the end result? formation of bone right which is formation of connective tissue right that's why we call it connective tissue metaplasia and this particular condition where there is formation of bone like tissue at the area of skeletal muscle which has suffered hemorrhage is myositis ossificans reason being myo refers to muscle itis refers to inflammation ossificans comes from ossification so there is ossification or bony deposition at the area of hemorrhage of the muscle